Hi guys, welcome back to Anna Dialogue, the dialogue on analog music reproduction. And indeed, in this video, we are going to focus at the epics of analog reproduction, especially considering cassettes. In fact, as you've seen from the title, today we are going to take a look to His Majesty, His Highness, the Nakamichi ZX9, one of the best cassette recorders out there. Are you ready? Let's go. Okay, you analog buffs. So those of you who are following me and pay attention to my videos knows that I have been using this cassette deck for several years now because it appeared in my last room tour although the room tour now is very dated here is a link if you're interested all the links are also present in the video description and i briefly showed you that also a zx9 was present among my gear because in fact i do my reviews my cassette reviews Here's a playlist of the different uh, videos on tape and especially cassettes. Every once in a while, I like to review one of my Walkmans, one of my decks. And today we're going to take a look at one of the most important of all, the ZX-9. Now, uh, I know that a lot of people actually don't know that much of this cassette. Who is a, a cassette geek obviously does. But usually the common knowledge is the Nakamichi Dragon or maybe the CR7, CR5 uh, or the 1000 ZXL and things like that. This one is among the top of the tops, especially for recording. And we will see why. But not only. I mean, there's lots of features that usually are not well explained, not delivered when somebody talks about this deck. In fact, we're going to go through five main points in order to see the main elements aspect aspects characteristics of this deck are you ready let's go okay before taking a look at the machine itself and also do a test yes we're gonna, we're gonna do a recording test we're gonna see how to calibrate the machine and things like that but let's try to understand a little bit the main components why this machine is different why this machine is so good so first of all the general specs now uh, i just want to go through the main specs uh for, for example we can already state which aren't that aren't that special actually for example the frequency response yes it's good it's 20 hertz up to 21 kilohertz good metal cassette signal to noise ratio 72 db good absolutely wow and flutter 0.022 percent very good total harmonic distortion 0.8 percent the fun fact is that already in 1982 because this is the year of release of the zx9 all the way up to 1985 the last model already in the brochure by nakamichi i was reading it before the video it's incredible i mean there's a whole paragraph uh, where the Nakamichi technics, uh, engineers, describe the importance of not chasing high specifications, excellent specifications. Those are not that good, actually, when you then you hear the cassette. And, I, and I, this is one of my main philosophy, I would say, points of this channel, of my passion regarding hi-fi. And I'm glad that also Nakamichi, the verdicts of... Uh, whatever however you look at it of cassette reproduction and recording together also with Tanberg and other fantastic uh, decks but I mean Nakamichi has a long tradition with a huge array of decks can't deny it and the ZX9 is one of the best one of I would say the top three absolutely and they claim that they are not chasing those specs they obviously there are minimum specifications that have to be matched but after that they use their ears they use their experience and they change things when they find the proper highly uh, regarded sonics that nakamichi is famous for and i love this philosophy okay so as you've seen the specs 
are nothing of special actually. Uh, I want to say something about the price. I didn't say that of other reviews actually, but I think it's interesting. When it was released in 1982, the street price was more around $1,500 which if you put that in the uh, inflation calculator is more or less today $3,500, which is funny because if you look on eBay now, the price is exactly that. It's almost like they, it maintained its value completely, 100%. Actually, you can find them also for five or $7,000, I've seen dollars. I mean, it's getting out of hand, this stuff, the, the, the cassette craze. But I understand that if it's in mint condition, always look for something nice and uh, clean, calibrated, uh, ready to go, overhauled, uh, tested thoroughly by a lab. That's important, and it's good. It's fair to pay a little more if that's the if the machine is in that condition. Not these prices, though. Now it's very very high. When I got mine, I paid half that. Okay, so let's proceed now and take a look at in detail a little more of the characteristics of this deck, fantastic deck. Okay, one of the fundamental points here is the motor. Now, strangely enough, this is a direct drive motor, something different uh, in, in, from the usual in Nakamichi. They usually use belts. They rely on belts. They think belts is practically the best solution because it somehow attenuates those that push and pull of the motor that those cogging in fact they decided to do this and they explained it in detail in the in the brochure only because they were capable of reaching a high quality level of reproduction because up until then we're, we're talking about 1982 obviously other great direct drive motors are going to be created afterwards but up until then not that many and if there were with some issues in fact they waited until they were ready 100 percent sure of putting out this motor because there were fluctuations in the, the uh in the in the rotation of the motor hence they that's why they always preferred a belt driven um cassette deck and they say the same is true also for turntables but they managed summarizing all the different technical aspects i will put a link to that brochure because it's a very interesting reading here below in the video description to summarize the final solution was creating a rotor with a starred shape pattern okay instead of having something circular which gives uh, a constant we could say motion this uh, star as you can see here's a picture as you can see it has a different pattern and the impulses the magnetic impulses for the rotation change are not homogeneous but it creates a homogeneous rotation in the end due to this different kinds of fluctuation i mean it's very interesting it's very ingenious i think and if Nakamichi claims that they are obtaining excellent wildflower flutter results, as they were declared 0 0.22, 0 0.022 actually, that's pretty, pretty good, especially if you're considering a direct drive motor. Okay, let's proceed. Okay, our third point is the transport. The transport is one of the most important aspects of all decks, and this one uh, has some special features. What is the main so solution we could say here the asymmetrical dual capstan transport because in fact again in that brochure it's very funny nakamichi claims actually most decks with one capstan deliver better are better sounding they perform better than dual cap than normal dual capstans and that's why they wanted to go a little bit ahead why is this because the two capstans usually turn in the same um, way in the same moment at the same speed and that's not good because obviously there are fluctuations there are differences also because as we know the diff two different spools uh, turn at a different at a different uh, speed so that's important to have a different regulation of that and with this they call it asymmetrical why because the two capstans have different dimension and go at a different speed so the tape tension is completely released at that point and 
it capable of being always in the optimal tension. It's not going to just follow the capstans rigidly. In fact, another part of this transport is the exclusion of the pressure pad. That's something very that very few people know, actually, because in this case, there is a special little lever that takes away the, the pressure pad. It's not the pressure pad inside the cassette. So at that point, you're not relying anymore on the cassette structure. It's the machine that it's completely taking into his possess <laughs> the tape and creating the optimal tension thanks to the motor and thanks also to the dual cap stand solution. Fantastic. Plus, everything is controlled by a four bit microprocessor already in that period of time. Wow which does uh, several controls, several checks for every second. So, I mean, the precision here is truly astonishing. Absolutely. Let's proceed. Okay, for our fourth point, I would like to spend a few words on the heads, on the optical solutions. If you see the, if you check the faceplate of the ZX9, as you can see, it says discrete heads. And that's not uh, just a normal three head deck. And why is that? Well, mainly it's the same reason actually why for the, for the Nakamichi Dragon, which also has three discrete heads, just like real to real players where you have erase, record and playback. And practically, I would say 95% of decks, even more probably uh, produ ever produced, always have, even though of high quality, the recording and the playback heads stuck together. It's just more simple. But obviously you're going to have um, crosstalk, bias um, feed through. There are some problems. And if you have the three discrete heads, it's always going to be better. Already this, it's incredible because you can understand the increase of, of work, of uh, engineering, of expense. Plus, they had to make the they had to change a little bit these heads. They claim the playback head is a little more narrow than standard, and the recording is a little more wide, in order to get the full spectrum. We're talking about microns, but nevertheless, they had put this attention. They they went out of the standard molds, the standard heads, the shelf heads, uh, also adopting a different type of solution in the creation of the uh, of the material. They call it crystalloy which obviously it's something invented. Uh, we don't know exactly, or maybe we do, I don't. It's, it's just a, a multi-layered permalloy, which is very good, actually. And again, we're in 1982. We're, we're at the beginning of those great heads. Amorphous heads are far distant. They're not, they're not available yet. Uh, instead, the permalloy is practically the best solution. And they, they say, they claim, they, they, they changed a little bit the head in order also to have the best frequency response in order to have the possibility to, that's why we have three discrete heads mainly, regulate the azimuth. In the Nakamichi Dragon, you can regulate the azimuth automatically for playback. That's one of the top features of the Dragon. But the ZX9, you can regulate the azimuth of the recording head by hand, not automatically. Wow. Afterwards, we're going to take a look at this feature. Clearly, if you can change that, you're going to have the best performance from your tape because you're getting exactly the zenith of the head is perfectly perpendicular to the tape. And it's going to be ha find also the, the perfect position to get the maximum out of it, to record as much as possible on it. The Nakamichi engineers claim that uh, more or less they had to do... Um, softer heads in order to satisfy all the different re prerequisites and not the normal permalloy hardness. This is a little more soft, but they say that their design of the head, uh, the different layering um, has excellent results and they declare that uh, the, the deck is going to lose 1 dB after 10,000 hours, which is a lot. I mean, if you start to lose 1, 2, 3 dB, that's 30,000 hours. That's a lot, guys. So you can use your deck for a very long time. Plus, these heads, last feature, are directly coupled to the amplifiers. There's no capacitors in the middle. 
directly connected. Obviously, that's always something better if, if the design is capable of dealing with that in order to have the best, best performance. Let's proceed. Okay, so for our last point, we are going to see the physical characteristics of the uh, deck. Plus, we're going to understand a little better the calibration features, why it's so important, why it's so effective, why it's so famous. And we're going to do also a, ca a manual calibration and we're going to do a test recording and listen to the sonics of a tape of a very high quality recording. Afterwards, we're going to come back and going to say a few aspects of the sonics. Let's go. Okay, guys, here we are with our fantastic Nakamichi ZX9. Let's turn it on. We're going to take a look now at the main features and after try to do a test recording to calibrate the, a specific type of cassette and do a recording and see what happens. That's why you already see this cable inserted because it's directly connected to the video camera. I'm not going to do all the fancy stuff. It's just going to go directly to the camera preamp, which is it's decent. Absolutely. OK, so as you can see on the far left, you can reset with the first button, the counter, which has four digits, the power button, the eject and the phono uh, 6.35 millimeter input. Then you have the well. I want to say immediately, don't worry if you're Nakamichi ZX9 does not have a window. I don't know why, but this model does not have glass or plastic, nothing. It's open like that. That's the way it, it, it was shipped already in 1982, all the way to 1985. Uh, let's take a look now at the different commands. Obviously here we have the eject, as I said, to open. Here we have the 50 dB lead meter in red. Uh, Nakamichi changed their colors during time. We had the, the orange of the, of the dragon. We have the yellow of the CR5 and 7. And this type is pure red, which I like a lot together with the, with the black. So a quite large, uh, a lot of headroom, a lot of dBs to calibrate and to see the different peaks. I like that a lot. Although the CR7 is even more if I don't go wrong. Here we have the main, obviously, buttons for rewind, played, fast forward, pause, stop, record, which you must push together with the pause button. You can mute the recording and here you have the master fader in order to fade the beginning or the end of our, our recording. And that's useful, for example, if you already know that you're not going to fit uh, all uh, the, the one song on one side instead of just stopping it. Uh, that sharply abruptly like that you just pe press here and you have a nice um, fading of the of the sound which is pleasant actually here we have the main commands for calibration connected with the parts here but before going into this let's just take a look here at the timer you have a few selections to, in order to program the timer if you want the equalization 70 microseconds or 120 Dolby we only have on these early models B and C. The MPEX filter, which obviously you're gonna practically always gonna keep off because that's connected to uh, radio recording, and the tape and source monitor, thanks to the three heads. Okay, so as we said, one of these particular features that I was mentioning before of this deck is the full control the full calibration, manual calibration, because automatic is nice, absolutely. It's easy and fast, but it's not precise. A manual calibration is always going to be the best of the best in terms of uh, recording sonics. Okay, so here we have uh, the bias button and the three types of regulation, as you can see, for the three, three types of tape. Nakamichi calls it EX type 1, SX the type 2, and ZX the type 4, the metal. And see, as you can see, we have the uh, little commands to regulate the, uh, the bias, in this case, the sensitivity, the levels here. In fact, this is where you have to calibrate, and why we're going to see exactly how to do this. Plus, we have the button, the fantastic button, to regulate the azimuth of the recording head. Wow. 
Here below we have the general output level, which as you can see, um, a technician put exactly where distortion starts. He recommends not to go past this because in a few decks you have that issue. It's better to go at a, all the way at a certain point and if you have obviously, obviously a measuring, measurement type of lab instrument you can see when the output is started to distort. And here is the level for this uh, machine, for this deck. And here you have the independent recording levels so you can also regulate that for any reason. Okay, let's start now to do our recording test. Okay, so we're going to Try to use a brand new tape. This is a chrome tape, type 2, Esprit by Sony, which is a pretty good, pretty decent type. I'm gonna open it with ya. As you can imagine, I have a good quantity of virgin new old stock tapes, just like this one. Okay. We have nice Norelco. Normal J card. Okay, and here is our tape, which should have a very good um, case, casing mechanism. Uh, there's no screws, unfortunately, but it should be rather stable. That's why this was, as, as you can see, anti, I think you can see it, anti-vibration mechanism. So it's always good if you have something also inner inside this but as we said before the nakamichi is somehow relieving the uh your cassette from all the stress and he is taking all the work when when he's trying to find the optimal tape tension okay so let's try to put our tape inside here we go and the first thing we want to do is immediately to put the the rec mode I'm going to push rec and pause, confirmed also by this little red button. And at this point, we're just going to start immediately by pressing the azimuth, and the recording is automatically going to start. Sometimes it doesn't, because maybe you, you, you took the cassette out and you put it back, so the machine thinks it's already calibrated for that, for that tape. Redo it, it's always better, but don't get worried. I mean, sometimes these machines are not how you would expect be, to, to behave. <laughs> There's always something strange going on, I must admit. In any case, let's start. See, it started, and as you can see, it's already detecting a wrong azimuth. It's already on the left. I know, it's green, it should be another color, but the, the main colors is red, so green is wrong. So we're gonna start to rotate this little uh, level here, this little knob, until we find a red dot in the center. See, not yet. A lot of times it lets you go all the way on the right and then you have to go backwards. Nothing, still far. Starting to get the right position. Okay, we're almost there. Yep, there we are. Perfect. Now we can take this off and as you can see, the meters lit up showing the 400 hertz level. Now we're calibrating uh, uh, type two, so we have to select type two. At that point, see, this is the level, so you have to go here. Take off this and start to regulate on cal, calibration. Okay, we're gonna try to put them both on zero. Extremely stable, very nice. The hard part is always the bias. Let's go with the bias, okay, slightly above. We're gonna take off also this little cap here and regulate the bias on zero. Very stable as you can see. Much more stable than my Dragon actually. Put it back, click reset and you're done. It goes back to the beginning with reset. It doesn't reset the calibration. It just brings the tape back so you're ready to record. At this point you can select the Dolby but up until now do not select it. In case, I, in my opinion, when you're using quality type 2 and type 4 cassettes no need of noise reduction. If you're going on one I would use it. Okay, 
So, let's try to record something. I was listening a few days ago to a fantastic album, Shifting Sands. I actually already did my nice little cassette. Here it is. And this is the Avishai Cohen Trio. Just released. Very, very good. Excellent jazz. We're going to try to record it also on here. Track number two, The Window. It's already going to go through my stream box by... Uh, project audio s2 ultra through my phone application it's already connected so first we're going to try to understand the levels clearly so uh, you're going to probably going to hear the song if i put source okay but i'm not going to put it yet so let's start okay you're going to hear the song afterwards. First, I want to see the levels. Because if we're using a Type 2 tape, it's better not to go beyond 2. It's just a, a rule. Plus, I noticed with this, at least in my deck, it's very sensitive. I mean, when the, 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 the signal is a little too strong and you're not using the right cassette, it's going to distort. I'm sure that uh, if I overhaul the whole thing and put new capacitors and everything in line, it would be even better. Or maybe the model is like that. I don't have an answer to that. In any case, it's better to peak at 2. So at that point, we're going to have to regulate here the level, which is already very low, as you can see. Very low. I mean, look how much I could go up. Wow. So I'm going to put it a little less on both sides, trying to be kind of equal there. Now it's peaking at 2, more or less. Yes. Okay, so at this point, we're ready. Let's stop. We're going to press record. And here we go. No, play. Sorry, you have to press play. Forgot. <laughs> Okay, I think now you have a clear idea. At this point, we can take a look at behind. I'll just show a picture, very easy. As you can see, we can have the classic RCA single-ended inputs and outputs. You have on the far right a voltage selector, so you can use it anywhere in the world. Wow, Gazawa, that's very rare. Plus, you have an uh, input for a remote control which it's called remote control, but all these had a cable clearly. But you could use it at a distance with a long cable. Plus you, has, you have this other input here, because if you want to use a microphone, as you have noticed, the ZX9 does not have a microphone input, but you can use this actually input here for the MX100, which is a microphone preamp mixer, uh, which you can connect uh, several microphones and therefore do your own recordings also with this machine directly. Very, very cool. Wow, guys. So, did you hear any difference between the tape and the source? And apart from that, the sonics of the tape, did you already understood its sonic signature? What do you think about it? Leave your comments here below. I'm interested. Okay, so I forgot to say that that recording, that fantastic jazz album, Shifting Sands, it's a 24-bit 
96 kilohertz recording. Wow, pretty impressive to manage that quantity of information and have that result. In fact, this is something common that I highly suggest and recommend. Uh, if you have, for example, a subscription with Cobos and, and with high resolution audio and material, use it on your quality decks and cassettes. The results are outstanding. I actually did a video on this topic. Here it is where to put MQA, DSD, all this high resolution media on tape. The link is also in the video description. So what are the impressions? What is my take on this deck? Why? Do I like it so much? Well, first of all, clearly we are facing a deck that is incredibly performing in the recording sector, as you can imagine. As I said, the Nakamichi Dragon, I want to say this immediately, in playback is just better. It's just a little more lively, I would say. Maybe I would use that word. It's a little more fresh, more, maybe slightly more dynamic even. It's better. But not a huge gap, okay? Not a huge step. If I hadn't had a dragon with me, this would already fulfill my entire, my dreams and my desires because uh, the, the, the signature of all its different frequencies are very, very good. I thought, I think you already heard that. What do I like about the Sonics? Well, it's a detailed, big sound. Typical of, of Nakamichi. I don't know why in, in, um, in some forums around they say that the lower register is not that precise, not that punchy, not that deep. Uh, well, more precise, but not that deep. I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't see this, actually. I don't hear this. And I'm sure about the deck because I sent it three times to a lab. I have a nice flat frequency response all the way up to 22, actually, more than the specifications. Everything is perfectly calibrated and ready to go, so I know I can rely on his, its performance. And I think it has an incredible ba bass. Uh, I love the sweet mid-register of the voices. Fantastic. And the most difficult of all for tape, the high frequencies. The cymbals, the, the crashes, uh, loud noises are just perfectly reproduced. Clearly, you're always going to have a little bit of con compression, constraint in, re in respect, for example, to reel to reel. I mean, reel to reel, you, the sound is full, big, huge. It really fills up the room. You have the whole sh scenario. Cassette is always going to, that's down, the downside of cassette, in my opinion. It always compresses a little bit the picture. But that picture, even though it's not a poster, it's a beautiful picture incredibly detailed very rich fantastic that you always want more it's so pleasing to hear and that's why this deck is one of the best absolutely if you can record with that and for example use a dragon or something your preferred one for playback because there is that distinction in audio like for example the famous um dynec type of recording which is found in the tanberg or the nad uh, and things like that it's very good in recording playback ah a step below absolutely and with the uh, the, the zx9 i have the, you i think you have the perfect balance i forgot to mention that there's also the zx7 which is slightly different it doesn't have a direct drive motor that's the main big difference so if you are out for the hunt and you you're finding these the zx9 very very expensive Look also for the ZX7. That's absolutely the best. Actually, some people prefer the 7 more than the 9. So keep that in mind. And something I forgot to say about the heads is that uh, the ZX9 is one of the few decks that really erases Type 4 metal cassettes. Because I always have a little bit of, of sound remaining. Guys, with this deck, it really cleans it away. It's fantastic. That's another plus for this deck. Okay, guys, so I want to know your comments now on the deck if you have it, on other similar decks, on other recording decks you think should be mentioned, and maybe someday I will review, hopefully. Thank you again for watching, and remember, music is born analog. Well, guys, if you're enjoying my videos and you're enjoying my channel, please consider to subscribe by clicking the black and white logo here below. 
Also, don't forget to click the notification bell so you'll never miss an episode and you will become a true member of the analog community.